everybody. So glad that you could join me again today. We're going to continue to look at the book of Romans in chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. And it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Hey everybody, Nerdman here, and today we're going to talk about Dynamite! <laughs> So, did you know that the gospel is God's dynamite for salvation? <laughs> okay, not really. So, uh, dynamite was like invented way later than when Paul used the word dunamis. So, if you're going to say that he was thinking about dynamite when he wrote the word dunamis, that's what we call anachronism. <laughs> D.A. Carson, in his book, Exegetical Fallacies, has this to say about that in Romans 1, 16. <laughs> in any case, even to mention dynamite as kind of an analogy is singularly inappropriate. Dynamite blows things up, <laughs> tears things down, rips out rocks, gorges holes, and destroys things. The power of which God, concerning which Paul speaks, he often identifies with power that raised Jesus from the dead. And, as this operates to us, its goal is a soterion, and that means to salvation. <laughs> yeah. Aiming for the wholeness and perfection implicit in the consummation of our salvation. Even so, Paul's measure is not dynamite, but the empty tomb. So, when we're talking about the power that's found in the gospel, we're not talking about something that destroys things. We're talking about something that builds up, raises to life, gives people new life. It's crazy, okay? So, I mean, I know Nerd Man, he's pretty awesome. He's handsome. He's um, inventive. He's humble. He's good looking. But even though Nerd Man has all these traits, he can't save you. He doesn't have that power. And by the way, Nerd Man's also inventive. Just check out this uh, dynamite. <laughs> I invented it myself. You know, so you don't have to like light a match or anything. All you have to do for this stick of dynamite right here is uh, press a button and it, and it should, oh, there it goes. It just lights right on up. <laughs> uh, Now, Paul begins off here saying that he is not ashamed. He says, why is he saying that? Well, if you back up to the previous verse, in verse 15, he says, I am so eager to preach the gospel. Now he's answering the question, why? Why is he so eager to preach the gospel? Because he's not ashamed of the gospel. Well, is there a cause to be shamed, ashamed about the gospel? Certainly there is. Uh, you can see later in, in the book of Corinthians, that he, even in the book of Acts, that Paul was beaten, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked. He, all these things occurred to him because of his faith and trust in the gospel. So certainly there was cause for shame to be there, but Paul says he's not ashamed about the gospel. Why? Because he believes in it is the power of God for Salvation. So what type of power? What does that lead to? It leads to salvation. Th this power has the effect to bring about someone's conversion. Somebody's conversion. Now, what is the gospel exactly? The gospel, this is the message of good news. That Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he raised on the third day. We saw before in this text that Jesus, the maker, the creator, the wonder, the one who's all sovereign, powerful, God of the universe, became like us. 
Have this mind among yourselves, that you would be like Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider that to be something to be taken advantage of, but emptied himself. How? By taking on the form of a servant, human form. He didn't empty himself of any of his divinity in that moment. This come, that comes from Philippians chapter 2. Rather, what he did was take on the form of humanity, the God of all the universe, becoming a human, dying on the cross, so that the wrath of God that was headed our way because of our sin, our unfaithfulness, our filthiness, that wrath was put on Jesus in our place if we place our faith, our trust, our, that, that is, he's our foundation, he's what we stand on. We put our faith in Him. And this believing that message, that gospel message right there, that God made Him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That gospel has power to convert people, to resurrect people, and it has the power to sustain people in that new resurrected regenerated life so it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes it's not just a general belief that you can kind of just believe it is a specific trust in Christ and in Christ alone that is leads to salvation it says to the Jew first and also to the Greek God's original plan, his intention, was for the Jews. It was, he did not establish a covenant relationship with any other people group out there other than the Jewish people. But this plan, in its infancy, grew up to be a mature plan of salvation for the entire world. Now, how do we attain this righteousness of God, this righteous status that God would give to us. It says in verse 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. How do we get this righteousness? It says, from faith for faith. So that is from God's faithfulness towards us that leads to our faith, our trust in Him. For as it says in the book of Habakkuk, and Paul quotes this, The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous, the one who has that right standing before God, should live by their trust, their allegiance, their setting their life on the foundation of Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and that and that alone. That is the power of God that brings about salvation. So for the application portion today, I want to look at four things again that we've been talking about as heat, thorns, cross, fruit. The heat being the situation that we're in. The thorns being the sinful response to that situation. And the cross being the theological truth that we find here in this passage. The fruit being the godly response to that situation. So the situation that you might find yourself in occasionally is that you've sinned, you feel discouraged about it, or maybe you're just feeling discouraged in general. You feel down. Things just don't seem to be going your way. Now, in that situation, which all of us find ourselves in sometimes, what is the simple response that we, that we do when we're in that situation. I've thought of three things in particular that I t tend to do when I'm feeling discouraged. One is it leads me to a melancholy, um, a, a sort of depression, where I kind of numb all the pain by just trying not to feel anything at all. I would rather feel nothing than feel that pain of being discouraged. Another is I start backbiting at the, the loved ones around me. When I'm already down and discouraged, 
You know, the typical English proverb is hurt people hurt people. Maybe that's another sinful response we can have about feeling discouraged. Another response that I do when I feel down is I shirk my responsibility. I I don't take the the God-given responsibilities in my life seriously. I want to have my own personal little pity party, and it's all about me. What is it revealing about my heart when those simple responses come into play in my life? What it, what's revealing is my discouragement ultimately is based on the fact that I had faith in myself and rather than having faith in God. And my faith in myself, my trust in myself failed because I failed. So what is, the, what is the fruit? What do we see in this passage? Romans 16 through 17, we see Paul saying that he's not ashamed of the gospel. In that gospel, there's power for salvation. How? By placing our trust in Jesus. To sum it up, the cross of this passage is trust in the gospel. That is the specific saving message of Jesus Christ revealed to us in the word of God. So when I was feeling discouraged, I was placing my trust ultimately in myself. And what I should be doing is putting my trust in God. So what is the fruitful response? When I'm feeling discouraged, instead of having those sinful responses, what should I do? I should preach the gospel to myself. It's a gospel encouragement that Jesus died for you. He, the God of all the universe, was made a low subject of a human, born in the humblest of circumstances, died one of the coolest deaths, all for you. Raised to life in power and victory for you. Sustains you to this day for you. Gave you His Holy Spirit to instruct you in all truth, to convict you of sin. All of this, God has displayed His wonderful faithfulness from all the way from the time that Adam sinned. He guided His people. He made a way of salvation all the way to you today. Instead of being discouraged at your lack of ability, at your sin that nags at you, be encouraged and be lifted up in the true gospel of the scriptures.